Hello and welcome along to the Panto Podcast. This week my guest is Neil Hurst. We talk about him being typecast, the transition of possibly him becoming a dame one day, and his opinions on song sheets. So please, sit back and enjoy the latest Panto Podcast. My guest for today's Panto Podcast is comedian Neil Hurst. Hello, sir. Hello. Thank you for having me. It's uh, lovely to, to finally do this. You know, <laughs> we've, we've been trying to book this in for quite a while, haven't we? So, uh, yes. and then something happened. Co- 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 uh, Coca-Cola. 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 <laughs> <laughs> but we're here, we're doing it. So we're doing it, thank you. finally. So, how did you get started off in the biz? Uh, well, I started by doing lots of amateur musicals, actually. My mum and my dad were very heavily involved with the local Amdram scene. And then um, I started getting involved as well. I thought, oh, this is all right. Singing and dancing, yeah, I can do all this. And next thing you know, I'm doing it for a job. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm, I'm the, I've always said this, I'm the luckiest guy in the world to do uh, to do what I do for a job, you know. And... Uh, yeah, just a lucky guy, right place, right time, all the time. Never, never a chore. <laughs> never a chore. Well, I don't know. There's been some matinees. Uh, Boxing Day matinees are always a oh. chore in the world of pantomime, aren't they? But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I just love it. I'm a lucky lad. Because we've been we've been chatting away for hours before recording this. And, yeah, we have. Uh, we should we should have recorded should, all that. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to go for it all over again. Yeah. Um, the importance of comedy then for you. When were you a funny child? Um, <laughs> you'd have to ask my parents about that. <laughs> I think so, yes. I mean, um, you know, we were saying before we started re- recording the podcast, you know, everybody loves a funny person, don't they? And uh, it, it, it's that, that kind of thing that you want to be loved. And, you know, as, as any actor or anybody in the world of show business, just love me, love me, love me. And uh, that, that funny character was always so, somebody that's, that sort of resonated with me and something I've always wanted to you know, try and get across, whether it be in a pantomime or a musical or a TV programme or a commercial, you know, anything, you know, as long as I'm I'm working, I want to be uh, making people laugh and making people smile. That's what a great job to do, you know, making people smile. It's, yeah, it's the luckiest job in the world, isn't it? Were you the class clown then? Uh, well, uh, t- funnily enough, when I was at school, I was the class singer. So I was, I was um, back in the days before pop idols and before uh, X Factors and stuff, there, there, there was not many, um, the, the early 90s, there were not many TV talent shows, but there was one on Yorkshire television called the Yorkshire Television Talent of Tomorrow. And I joined up singing um, uh, Luck Be a Lady Tonight. <laughs> so, <laughs> so little 14 year old Neil with a bass baritone voice, one of them precocious, horrible kids that you see <laughs> singing on telly nowadays and you just want to slap. Well, that was me. So I was that kid who was always singing at school and the end of end of uh, the summer term, I'd always do a big concert in the school hall, and all the uh, kids from the school would come and see me singing with the jazz band or the or the rock band or whatever. And uh, same at Christmas, I'd do a big Christmas show for the kids at school, and I was always, oh, singer, sing us a song, because I was always on telly singing or. Oh, you know, I was on Barrymore when I was a kid singing and stuff like that. So I was always the kid who was always singing. Um, it wasn't until I got uh, a bit older, started going bald and got fat, that became funny. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to dig that out. Is it on YouTube then, that clip? Yes, don't don't look for it. Still, yeah, it is. It is, actually. I think it's, yeah, I think it's on my channel. I think so. Is it? Oh, there, yeah. good. I'm very thin. I've got a face full of braces as well. <laughs> yeah. Bless. Did you ever get nervous then, when you were a kid? Um, performing in front of such a large crowd. No, not not particularly. No, 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 no. No, it's never really any, anything that's ever. I've never really been nervous before I perform. Really, I get nervous in auditions. You know, I get nervous going and think, oh, "Am I doing this right?" You know, but I've always thought, you know, if if you're if you're going on stage, you should be there should be that little bit of nervousness. But I, I never really seem to get it. I don't know why. I don't know. Maybe, perhaps if somebody important's in, I might get it. I did a show a few years ago and I knew Andrew Lloyd Webber was watching and uh, I got a bit nervous then. <laughs> Could you imagine a sort of a, 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 a sort of a XL version of The Phantom, for instance? Yeah. Wouldn't that be good? I don't think they've ever had it. Yeah, uh, the, the flabtum of the opera. <laughs> that would be me. Night time shall happen. Yes, now you're talking. A fat phantom, that, that's a great idea. Andrew, Hello. <laughs> 
<laughs> with half the orchestra. With but only anyway, half the orchestra. Yes. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. No comment about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, pantomime then. Did you go as a kid to go and see many? No, no. I... Um, I knew what pantomime was, and I remember being a kid winning a colouring competition in the local newspaper, Halifax Evening Courier. I won a colouring competition to go see the YMCA pantomime Three Bears, Goldilocks and Three Bears, mm. um, uh, just in case you were worried about any other Three Bears. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Goldilocks and Three Bears. I remember going to this pantomime and watching it a little... Uh, little theatre in Halifax and being absolutely terrified by these bears so I never went back to, to see another pantomime and then um, fast forward quite a few years then and I was about 18, 19 and um, I went to see um, a friend of mine, uh, a lovely lady called Emma Williams who went on to do the Palladium Panto, a big West End uh, leading lady and she would got a role in um, a pantomime in Middleton in uh, Manchester for a producer called Mark Andrews and um, I went to see the pantomime and I was absolutely amazed by how this thing which I was so terrified of as a little boy was now on stage in front of me and I was just absolutely soaking it up and loving every second of it and uh, that following year um, Emma kindly uh, managed to to pull a few strings and get me an audition so I went down for the audition I remember it very vividly it was um, the day of the audition was the day that uh, the Queen Mother's funeral took place on. So I was in London when there was the mm. Queen Mother's funeral. I remember not being able to get from one side of town to the other very quick <laughs> for this audition. Uh, I went into the audition where I met um, uh, Mark Andrews, who was the producer, and um, uh, we clicked instantly. And uh, he gave me my first pantomime role, played uh, um, Silly Billy or Simple Simon. It's what you know, one of them. They're interchangeable, <laughs> them two. Uh, at uh, the Middleton Civic Centre in Manchester and then at the Royal Spa Centre in Leamington Spa I doubled up that year so I went to the audition I met Mark and uh, we just we hit it off straight away so he gave me um, my first pantomime then it was playing Silly Billy at um, the Jack and the Beanstalk at the Middleton Civic Centre in um, Manchester M- Middleton Manchester I don't even think it's there anymore I think they've t- torn it down it's a shame it was nice yeah. um and then uh, that i remember that played up to like christmas eve and then from boxing day onwards we moved the show no it was a different show sorry it was a different show like aladdin i think uh, uh royal spa center in leamington spa so my first panto was two pantos in one essentially so i did uh jack and the beanstalk and then uh, aladdin um in uh, for, for mark andrews and ah oh, such a brilliant time and i ended up working for mark for about four or five years then i moved to Hunstanton and there was uh, the Princess Theatre in Unstanton for about five years there. It was great fun. You bit the bug. Yeah, very much so. I, I couldn't believe that... Um, I couldn't believe I was doing something where there was a script, but if you can you can jump off it and, and in different places, and you can kind of have a bit of anarchy and, and bring it back in. As long as the story was always told, that, you know, I've always believe that's the most important thing you know get, get the story across as long as that story is told and the anarchy works with it really well you can always sort of channel that into different directions and oh I've, oh, I've loved doing pantomime it's been one of the best best jobs in my career has been being a pantomime comic I've loved every second of it we were talking earlier about weight and you said that panto it falls off you yeah easily yeah yeah well, you ain't got time to eat much. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I, I always call pantomime my reset period, really, because uh, <laughs> I go away and do do pantomime, take the money from pantomime, pay me tax bill, puts me in the bank, so it pays me for the rest of the year, and then uh, um, and 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 the weight, you know, I got so fat this year that I lost all this weight to pantomime, which has been great. But apart from Panto 2020, never happened, obviously, for uh, for obvious reasons mm. this year. Uh, so I've just stayed fat. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, hey, there's been plenty of telly opportunities so, <laughs> where they need a little fat man. So it's, it's, it's quite all right. It's worked in my favour. <laughs> Do you ever get sick of being typecast? Um, no, not at all. Not at all. I I, um, I often thought... Um, I, I No, not really. I, I often get to the, the point where I sometimes think where people say, oh, it's you from Pantomime, it's you from Pantomime, you from Pantomime. I think, yeah, but I've done a lot more other than just Pantomime. Panto is something I do for 
five or six weeks at the end of the year, you know, when the rest of the year you've got to fill with a musical, a TV program, a you know, play, whatever, you know. Um, so I, I often get a little bit um, like, well, I, I do do other things as well <laughs> as, as this. But in some respects, it's nice that people go, oh, it's Neil from the pantomime because you, you kind of, you mean so much to, to, to audiences especially when you're in a venue for, for, for as long as I've done, uh, well, as long as I did Halifax. I did Halifax in West Yorkshire, uh, the Victoria Theatre for Imagine, uh, for 10 years. And I became a big part of people's Christmas experience, you know, and it, it was lovely. But, I burp then, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm, sorry, everyone, I'm on Diet Coke. Um, <laughs> uh, and you're so much so, uh, a part of people's Christmas, and it is, it is absolutely fabulous to be that part of someone's Christmas. But for me, there comes a point where I've done 10 years in a venue and I've done, for me, three or four years longer than perhaps I felt I should have done. There was no challenge anymore. I was kind of going out doing the same old same old shtick, really, and, mm. and I wanted a different challenge. And initially, I wanted a year off. Uh, little did I know I'd get one the following year when uh, <laughs> COVID came around. But um, um, then I, I, I just uh, was kindly invited over to, to Kudos to, to do Panto for them and uh, I had a wonderful time uh, working for Kudos in Hull and um, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm just loving loving their shows I love their production values, it's it's really really good, so I'm chuffed to bits I've worked with some great people Mark Andrews Productions taught me everything I really need to know about pantomime uh, and Mark is still a great pal of mine, he, he's probably listening to this now bless him, and um, uh, and he's, he's a lovely man and we we've done loads of stuff together and then working for imagine you who care so much about the really care about the story and really really care about the magic of pantomime and creating that that was so lovely to be involved working with imagine and steve and sarah run imagine are just absolutely wonderful um uh, and that they're, they're great and uh, rob who was the director in in Halifax he's such a, a worldwide mind of, of pantomime there's nothing he doesn't know about the world of pantomime and it was so great to work with um, uh, Rob Marsden he's called a great director and I learned a lot from him as well just about the storytelling which is vital um, and now to work for Kudos is equally as wonderful the wonderful production values and and uh, you know th these great big spectacular shows it it's it's fabulous. I absolutely love it. I'm a lucky man. <laughs> what was it like then going to that venue in Hull for the first time? Well, I've, I've toured there in different shows over the years, so I knew the venue. Mm. But um, it was it was it was really weird because in Halifax, I've done ten years in the venue, and you're kind of a big fish in a little pond kind mm. of thing. Um, and and to to move to another venue, and you think, well, I had a lot of swing in Halifax. I had a lot of say with. With you know, or we'll do this sketch, or we'll, we'll, or how about I say this? It's funnier. You don't really know when you go to work for another company what it's like, what it would be like. But it was very similar, you know. It was really nice that they respected the, you know, the pantos I've done over the years, and they knew I've been there, done it, got the t-shirt. So it was a, quite an easy little transition, really. It was just a longer drive. <laughs> <laughs> what about winning over the the new audience? Um, it, it, well, it was very strange. So in Halifax. After about two or three years doing the same venue, you walk out on stage and everyone's like, "Hey, is he a Ray?" Yeah. Whereas in Hull, I walked out on stage and nobody knew who I was, <laughs> um, which <laughs> which actually was great because it was a real challenge then. Because for me, then the obstacle that I've got to get across is that they have to love me by the end. Well, as soon as I as soon as I finish that opening spot, I want them on my side. I want them to be in the palm of my hand from the begin from the end of that opening spot onwards. So um so that was a big challenge really to 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 not have an audience set up ready to love you straight away. You've got to go and earn their love and respect. Um you just th through that opening spot, you know, and uh, touch wood. They've invited me back uh, they invited me back last year, but obviously COVID couldn't do it. <laughs> Um, so I'm going back this year and hopefully they've remembered us. Mind you, it's been a long time. They've probably forgot us. <laughs> <laughs> Something about the West End shows. Yeah. What made you want to go in that direction? Well, musical theatre was something I'd always loved being part of as an amateur. And I've got to be honest, I couldn't do anything else. I wasn't very good at anything else. <laughs> so, I, yeah, that was sort of started out doing a lot of musical theatre. But I've got to be honest with you... Um, the, the lifestyle just didn't suit me at all. Um, being in, doing eight shows a week and 
been in the same venue for month after month after month. And with a musical, it's not like pantomime. You can't twist it or change it, you know. Um, it's, it's, it's rigid, like, yeah. It's right, you know, why were you stood on mark number three when you should have been stood on mark number two? It's, it's It can be quite, you know, um, regimented like that. So I, I did find it quite... Um, quite difficult if I'm honest you know the lifestyle as well you know the, the it was it was it was party all the time and you know which sounds great but you know it's you can wind down very slowly and for me I always I always wanted to meet that girl settle down have a couple of kids and mm. when I came back up north where we're recording today <laughs> I, met, I met that that lovely wife and uh, we had two lovely daughters and uh, you know, life is good, and now I nip off and do. I might do a musical. I'll take it on, uh, but I like being on the road, doing it on a tour or something like that. So at least I'm home every weekend, and I'm that can be dad. So what were the shows then that you've been the big musicals? That oh, been? Um, so the, well, the most recent one. You're holding a mug from it at the minute, actually. It was uh, Fat Friends, the musical, which I uh, well, that was the latest tour I did. That was um, no, it wasn't the latest one I did. But uh, I'll tell you about Fat Friends. Uh, that was with. Um, um, the one of the greatest musical theatre performers who's ever won the Ashes, um, Freddie Flintoff. So uh, <laughs> Freddie Flintoff was um, uh, played uh, one of the leads in Fat Friends the Musical with us. We toured all over the country with that, and it was great. Um, I was with um, uh, two of my two who have become two of my absolute best pals. Well, I've got loads of best pals on that, but um, I then started doing a podcast with uh, Jodie Prenger and um, Natalie Anderson. Natalie was in Emmerdale. And uh, we started doing this podcast. We only had about 100 listeners, so we knocked it on the head. Nobody was, nobody was interested in it. Not like this great, grand, wonderful <laughs> production we're doing now. The Beast. Now. The that Beast. That I didn't think it was going to turn into this. Well, it's great, though. It's, it has. I mean, and it's given a platform for so many people. I, I've listened to loads and thought, oh, that's great. And it's just nice to hear stories, isn't it? You know, so, I mean, everybody's got a story to tell, haven't they? You know, so it's it's great fun. But, uh, but yeah, and then there were Kevin Kennedy, who plays Curly in Corrie. <laughs> Um, he'd be good for the podcast. He's a great laugh. He's, he's Kev, and Sam Bailey was on it as well. Sam's great fun, and so we all we all had a, a great fun on that on that musical. That was the last one touring around. Uh, another one I did recently was Early Doors. Now, um, do you remember the Royal Family? Yes. Um, so the Royal Family was written by Craig Cash and Caroline Hearn. Well, after they did that, um, Craig and his uh, writing partner Phil wrote um, a, a sitcom called Early Doors. It was about a pub uh, in Manchester, and they did a stage version of this, and it was kind of like a mini musical. We had a big musical number at the end as well, uh, and um, the, there was a role that was played by the actor Mark Benton, but Mark was uh, filming a TV show at the time, so they, they replaced Mark with with my character, who's a, a similar character, and I joined the uh, early doors, and we toured all over the UK, and uh, that was bizarre because we were playing arenas as opposed to theatres. Um, it was crazy we started out doing that show which is if you know the show it's in the it's in a pub basically it's just just a tiny little room in a pub the whole sitcom is set in this very much like the royal family just in a small mm. room um but we started that at the lowry but not in the big theater in the lowry in manchester there's a smaller theater which holds about ooh, four or five hundred people so we started in there but by the end of the tour we're playing manchester arena to seventeen and a half thousand people a night <laughs> and it was like this has just gone from the sublime to the ridiculous. You know, <laughs> this is huge. Um, but it was great, and we, you know, we took it into the West End. We played uh, Apollo Hammersmith as well. You know, like live at the Apollo. So that that was that was really cool. Um, but but uh, yeah, then other musicals, Evita. I played Megaldi in Evita, the, uh, the 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 first the first love of Ava Perron, and I was a brother in Joseph and his amazing technical duffel coat and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, loads of great musicals, and uh, I, I love all that sort of stuff. I, I, I like doing, I like, I like doing a play and then just bursting into song. <laughs> <laughs> I love the, I just love the absurdity of it. You know, it's great fun. It really is. What roles have you got your sights set upon? Oh, that's a good question, isn't it? I'd love to be. I'd love to be in a position where. Um, I'm very much aware of, of show business being show business. I know why they put stars in um, in big roles in musicals. You need a celebrity to get bums on seats. I totally get that. So I want to be in a position where I'm famous enough so so I can just do the parts I want to play. <laughs> you know what I mean? I want to play um, 
Tevye in Fiddler on the Roof. I want to play Fagin in Olive. I want to play um, Amos in Chicago. You know, a lot of the time these, the, you know, big tours, they're going to go to names these parts, mm-hmm. aren't they? So I'd love to be in a position where I can go, ah, oh, yes, Neil Hurst as Fagin. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be great. But these great character roles, you know, to me, no, I've. Uh, I'm, I'm past the days of the romantic lead, you know. <laughs> uh, just uh, lovely, uh, great character roles. I love, to, I love to play. But who knows? There's loads. Of the, the, there's one man, two governors. That's a great play. I'd love to play, uh, uh, play the, the the man in that. And uh, there's just there's just so, so many great opportunities. And you know, I'd, I'd love to. You know, I just like to work. I could, <laughs> I'd love to see you as Francis. Actually, I reckon you'd be brilliant in there. Yeah, it'd be good, governors. good, good fun. I'd love to do that. Such a um, physical role, though, as well. Yeah, well, it's pantomime, isn't it? It really? is posh panto. A posh panto. Yes. Posh panto. Um, so, so that uh, one day, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> and would you be phantom if given the chance? Yeah, but it would be a fat phantom. Oh, the, uh, yeah, the boat would sink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I reckon with a bit of work, I could sing it still. Yeah, yeah, but uh, who knows? What do you do then to keep the old vocal? vocal you know no. muscles in shape I, d- I don't do anything i really <laughs> should say i do this routine of, of, of warm-ups every morning no unfortunately i don't and um it was always that thing you know i i, I would do I, I, I would work on a musical and we you obviously go down for your warm-up before before the show or even at pantomime you do warm-ups before the show and, and you're sort of warming up your your vocal cords and everything like that and I was always the one going rah, 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 rah. not really trying and I, uh, it's naughty I know I should <laughs> but luckily it was always alright always came out alright touch wood <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah I, I, I did many many years singing in the in the working men's clubs around Yorkshire you know so when I wasn't doing a, a musical or a pantomime or a play or anything I would be going and doing um, singing in working men's clubs 150 quid a night between bingo three spots very nice you know yeah so your voice is always on tip top form anyway because you're singing all the time you know and uh yeah a long one of them days now <laughs> was that when before the smoking ban it was during it so so before and after yeah, yeah yeah how did you find that then the difference between because i know when i worked Brilliant. in clubs yeah i i like this the smoking man coming in because when you you got home your stage suit didn't smell. yeah it didn't stink did yeah, it? yeah you could wear your best jacket and yeah stuff. yeah yeah <laughs> i often remember being on stage and they said ladies and gentlemen live for one and only please want to welcome on stage mr neil hurst and the curtains is open and this wall of smoke it hit you <laughs> <laughs> did that affect the voice uh, it it may have done, yeah, yeah. I don't really remember it doing, but um, but yeah, it was yeah. But opening just after it sounds opening your bag of of wires when you set up your PA equipment, and it didn't smell of, of smoke. It was just <laughs> mind blowing, um, um, and I just wish there was more opportunities for that nowadays. I mean, I think that this, this well, I, I don't think COVID will have done them any any good really either. But I know there was less and less opportunities for for people going out and I always remember um, when I first started in the, the mid 90s singing in clubs getting about 150 quid a night and then fast forward what 10 15 years when the last time uh, ago when I last did it and uh, it was still on the same kind of money yeah. it never <laughs> went up maybe you might get another tenner if you were lucky uh, or if you told a few jokes you got another 50 quid you know what I mean uh, but um but that was always the thing I was. I was always. I never went out as a, a singer comedian. Uh, agents always said, "Oh, you have to go out as a comedy vocalist. You get more money for that." But for me, I was always like, I can be funny as a character. I can be funny as wishy washy. I can be funny as buttons or whoever. But but being funny as Neil Neil Hurst is is. I always found it difficult, and not difficult. Because I was saying the exact same words, you know, I was doing an opening spot essentially. And when I've gone on tour and hosting opportunities, I've always been the, you know, funny sort of host guy. But I've always been able to, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome and put somebody else on when I'm hosting. But when I'm going out as myself, I'd always have to rely on if they're not laughing, don't worry, here's a song I'll sing for you instead, <laughs> you know, to me. So that's always, you know, I, I could never, well, I could, that, that thing is, I know I could go out and I could do half an hour spot without singing because I've done it but I like to know that I've got a song in the back of my head because if it's not going well here's a song for you <laughs> <laughs> who have been then your comedy influences well I've been so lucky over the years I mean when I, I did a lot of variety theatre when uh, when I first came back up north and 
I've worked summer seasons with, um, um, well, <laughs> crikey, Ken Dodd, Bob Monkhouse, um, Cannon and Ball, the Grumbleweeds. But the, the, the guy I worked with more than any of, any of those is Billy Pierce. So I did the summer seasons with Billy in Blackpool on the pier and at the Grand Theatre. And I learned so much working with Billy, just, just standing in the wings watching him and um, just... And actually doing sketches with him as well. I remember doing this one sketch with him, and I said something in while we were rehearsing. It went, "Do that, love. It's funny. That it's funny that you do that." And I was like, "Yeah, but it's a funnier line if you do it." He said, "No, it's funny if you do it." And then he explained why. And I always thought he was a really, well, I always thought he, was, he still is a very, very kind and generous performer to work with. And, you know, if you can get a laugh, you, you get a laugh. You know, he, he's not bothered about being the. The, the, the funny guy and the star of it. He just wants, you know, for the good of the show. And that was what I, uh, one of the best things I ever learned off Billy was the good of the show outweighs the good of the performer. So, and, it's, and this is especially true in pantomime. I've seen, a, I've seen so many wonderful pantomimes, but for every wonderful pantomime, I've seen a dreadful pantomime as well, where the performers get to absorbed in themselves basically and it's all about them where actually the most important thing the most important part about Cinderella is Cinderella the most important part about Babes in the Wood is Babes in the Wood Dick Whittington is the, the most important part Dick Whittington his story is the most important mm. thing and you, you, you as a you as an, an actor being you see I've always gone into pantomime as I'm an actor playing a comic playing wishy-washy mm. uh, because I think it's vital that the story is the most important element. I remember seeing this one pantomime. I won't name the company. And um, we we were it was Jack and the Beanstalk. And uh, at the beginning of the second half started, and they said, "Come on, everyone, uh, we need to go up the Beanstalk to save Jill." And then it suddenly dawned on me. I thought, Jill hasn't been stolen and taken up the Beanstalk. They'd, they'd left that bit out of the script. They'd just forgotten to put that bit in. <laughs> It's like that's the really important part of the story, but they they were so wrapped up in doing their sketches and stuff, and uh, they they were so wrapped up in the anarchy side of it mm. that, that they'd forgotten that. And I was absolutely amazed that such a huge plot hole was there in something that they'd been doing for weeks and weeks and weeks. You should have seen that that big hole was there. But anyway, I mean. Yeah, I've always thought the most important thing is that little kid on the front row absorbed in the story. Because if you help the kid with the story, you've gotten for everything. And I don't just mean you've gotten for that pantomime, you've gotten for life. Um, so I've always thought, you know, and that's one of the best things I learned off Billy, really, you know, is to, to th- it's always the good of the show, not the good of the performer. And Billy's, oh, such a wonderful, wonderful pantomime performer. Um, and I'm really lucky now that. Um, you know, I kind of do the show that Billy does at the Alhambra. I do it in Hull the following year. So uh, I go watch it and go, all oh, right, yeah, I like that when you did that bit. So I might take that idea and I'll work on it and make my own version out. When I do it in 12 months' time, it'll be like this, you know. So um, I'm very, very lucky in that respect. But he was very generous working with me. I remember remember we did a, sh- uh, a show at um, Blackpool Grand because I was doing a sketch with Billy on this show. It's like a big charity event. He said, no, love, you stay with me, you stay with me, love. And then we were all in, we were in this dress room. There was me, Joe Longthorne, Billy, obviously, um, Johnny Casson, Frank Carson. Uh, basically, I was the only person in the dress room I've never heard of, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, but just to sit in this room with all these great comics all riffing off each other, it was just, oh, just just bliss it was wonderful I remember texting my dad saying I'm in a dressing room with <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah it's great great fun a lovely performer and and uh, like I said uh, just standing in the wings watching watching people you, you know I've often said this about theatre school but, but when in pantomime you get a lot you get a lot of actors in, in pantomime working for their first time you know because they finish uh, theatre school in say August September and their first job they use a pickup is panto, and I believe I genuinely believe you will learn more doing a pantomime standing in the wings than you than you could ever learn about pantomime at a theatre school. You know, just stand here in the wings and just just watch the rhythms and stuff. You know, it, it, it's so important. It's so important. How was it for that very first time you did a song sheet? Wow, that's a question and a half, isn't it? I've done thousands of song sheets. I've got loads of things have gone wrong in song sheets. I love that. <laughs> but was it nervous though, being in such close proximity with a child? 
No, nope. because I was still a child myself. Were you? <laughs> yeah, I was very young. I was very young. Well, the first song sheet I did was that Jack of the Beanstalk in Middleton, and um, oh, I was about nineteen, probably. So yeah, not a child, but you know, well, I was compared to what I am now. We still but, are, though, aren't we? Yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah, I suppose so. We were only saying that before we start recording. We were just man, child, aren't we? But uh, but yeah, the uh, doing a song sheet for the first time was brilliant, and it's still my favourite bit of the pantomime. And and I get sometimes I get cross with. Um, producers who don't like you to uh don't like you to over egg a song sheet because song sheets in my, in my opinion a song sheet can be five minutes long um but if it's going really well you don't kind of want to stop that do you so if you've got a normal song sheet that's two and a half three minutes long it can if you get this kid on stage, you don't want to let that kid go off stage until you've kind of rinsed everything out and that you can, you know. Um, so I, I really think it's, it's brilliant to, to, to just get as much as you can out of it. So it, it kind of annoys me sometimes when when uh, producers or directors say, Neil, you've gone on a bit too long with that song. She, it, was, it was six minutes today. So yeah, but that kid was brilliant and the audience were lapping it up. Um you know, I'd much rather that kid gets the laugh than me gets the laugh any yeah. day. You know, um, but I've had some oh, some great fun. I've had. I remember once this this saying, "Hello, little boy. What's your name?" He said his name. Said, um, "What do you want for Christmas?" He said, "Taekwondo gear." I went, "Oh, what's Taekwondo?" And he went, "This." He went, ah, cha, cha, cha. and he started beating me up in the middle of the stage in Taekwondo. <laughs> yeah. and then, of course, was the everyone's had a little boy or a little girl that's wet themselves. One year. This was at Halifax. This um, I was doing the song sheet. I talked to this little boy, and uh, he was great. And then I turned around and talked to this other kid, and I heard the audience absolutely howling with laughter. I'm thinking, what's going on here? Um, and I thought, oh, I must be so funny. Here. I must be so funny. <laughs> but then I realised, I turned around, the little boy who I'd just been speaking to had pulled his trousers down, and he got his like little bits out, and he was wiggling them in front of the oh. audience. 1500 people in the audience <laughs> and, and he's got, got his little bits out and he's wiggling around I mean you shouldn't have done that <laughs> no I'm only joking and it was um, yes it was he was just wiggling his bits out so I then sort of came up behind him pulled his trousers up and everything said no we can't do that and everything and and that was the end of that the audience in hysterics anyway I came off the stage and the, the show happened and the, the bows and then I came back to my dressing room the theatre um uh, managers and stuff were, were there saying, ah, oh, we, we heard what happened. Uh, there's a few forms to fill in, you know, for safeguarding and what have you, because, you know, this happened, that happened, which is understandable, you know, we need to document what happened and everything. Um, and one of the questions on this form was, um, who was, who saw the event? And I was like, about 1,500 people <laughs> saw this event. <laughs> and then I had this one kid who fainted. Yeah, um, it was quite recently, only the past few years. Uh, she was on stage and we were we were doing the song sheet and uh, she just like looked really wide eyed at me and just went whoosh, 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 face planted the floor and there was blood everywhere fifteen hundred people in watching the show as well just blood splashed all over the thing she got up she bust all her nose and everything we managed to get her in the wings and you know you're still in character as buttons or whatever character I was then trying to keep the audience happy and cheerful but this poor little girl just smashed her face on the floor. And, <laughs> There's blood everywhere. Luckily, she was all right, and she, we got a ticket to come back and watch the show again. And she came backstage, and we, we met her on, and it was all okay. But cry here, yeah, that was interesting. <laughs> so when children are upstaging you, you know, like I love beating it. you up, and... love it because that's a bit they always go home and people say, "Oh, wasn't wasn't that kid funny?" Can we hear that? that you probably hear the sirens on that, can't you? Yeah, it's, it's the comedy police. <laughs> <laughs> But no, I, I absolutely love it because, like I say, people always go home remembering them bits, don't they? I love it when somebody says to me, oh, hey, we came to the night in the pantomime where you got that bit wrong. And I always think, yeah, we, we got that wrong every night. We, we do that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> do you like it as well, though, in the rehearsal period when, when things organically happen? Like yeah, that? very much so. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the magic of pantomime, isn't it, really? Or I like it when you're on stage and something will happen and you think, Oh, that's good. If we can try, try and keep that in. Nine times out of ten, you can never keep it in because it it only goes wrong once, and then it's contrived and it looks crowbarred in. But sometimes something will happen on the stage. You think, let's keep this in and see if we can make it work, and it can become so much more. One thing uh, which which 
I kept in was we were doing the year Baby Shark came out. Baby Shark. Do, 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 do. Funnily enough, that was on my Alexa when we were in. Yeah, the, I didn't want to sign anything. Yeah, but, it was. Uh... It was. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was Baby Shark that was the, that was the big hit, obviously. And um, there's a line in it that says "safe at last." Do, 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 do. And I always thought it was safe at last. So so I was like safe at last. Do, 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 do. And uh, that kind of evolved into something. And that'll get people, when I'm coming out of the theatre, they'll say, hey, say fat lass. <laughs> Not say fat lass, say fat <laughs> last. <laughs> but yeah, it's good. I love things like that, you know, organically sort of turn into something brilliant. You know, it's great fun. Why do you think it is that Northern people, are, uh, for me, seem to be funnier? Um, I think we've got a, a funnier sense of humour up north. I know, I know we've got a, a funnier sense of humour. Sorry if there's any Southerners listening to this, but when you've toured as much comedy as I have, you, you trust me, you know when you get bigger laughs and you get them north of Watford. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think, no, no, I, no I, I'm probably misquoting myself on that, really. I think audiences down south can be more reserved, shall we say, Um but you can't hear a smile, can you? <laughs> I always say that. Great audience, but you can't hear a smile. And um, up north, I think we've, we've just got to, uh, you know, we just just let us air down a bit more. You know, we're not we're not afraid to go. Hey. <laughs> um, whereas where I've toured shows, maybe it's because of my northern sense of humour and the stuff I'm saying isn't particularly funny down south. I don't know. Um, but um, yeah, I think I think there is that warmth, and, and there's all them, you know, the famous northern comic, you know, like your Peter Cage, your Victoria Woods, you know, who have got the, the great warmth about them, you know, that that I, I sometimes feel um, southern comics don't necessarily have a. They can be very very funny, but there isn't that warmth of come here, come come with me or take you on a journey. We'll have a right laugh together. It'll be lovely. As opposed to, here's a joke, I'm going to tell you a joke. You know what I mean? <laughs> Having said that, one thing I always do every year before pantomime, I always watch um, uh, Jim Davidson's Cinderella or Boobs in the Wood. I always watch one of them. Um, good, famous Southern comedian, Jim Davidson. And, and I don't watch it for the, the humour. I don't watch it for the joke. I watch it to try and get in that rhythm. So... I all I think if anybody's listening and want to know how to do pantomime, go and watch Jim Davidson's rude pantomime. Don't listen to the joke. Well, you can listen to jokes if you want. I'm not going to say what a good joke is or a bad joke, but that it's rhythms. It's that it's that little wink to the audience that I know this is ridiculous. You know this is ridiculous. But we're all on this journey together. And so many people say, how do you, you know how do you approach pantomime? And I always approach it in that same way. I do it in the, this the same style that Jim Davidson's rude pantomimes are. The fact that I know this is daft. You know this is daft. We're all children, all together. We're all having a good time. And I, you know, obviously, the, I would never say any of them jokes on stage because, well, <laughs> I'd get fired. Uh, <laughs> but. Um, but I, I I just really like the, his rhythms and and the way that them shows are put together. I think the rhythm of it is so important. I've asked Jim a couple of times to be on. He's refused. Really, Jim, Jim if you're listening, which you won't be, <laughs> I've asked him because he did pave the way for adult panto. It oh. wasn't really done before. Well, again, I've seen so many awful but adult pantomimes. I mean, the I've seen. I, I, I've got to be honest. I've only ever seen three brilliant adult pantomimes. Uh, them two Jim Davidson ones was, well there's three Jim Davidson ones so I've seen them three and um, I wrote one <laughs> which I thought was very very good I wrote one for the Turbine Theatre with Jodie Prenger this Christmas and it did really well we got great reviews and stuff and uh, um, it was very filthy though <laughs> <laughs> because I've heard people say about writing adult panto is you just chuck in it's like a normal panto but chuck in a few extra no I, I disagree entirely I think the because because it's such a sensitive subject you don't know whether to what what can upset people nowadays with 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 adult humor you know you have to be you have to be so careful i think that for me the adult pantomime thing is that we're all children here today aren't we boys and girls we may say a few rude words but it, it, it's it's I, I think it's more complex than just saying a few f words i think it it, it it has to go back and be looked at, and it's got to be a lot cleverer, I think. So, what we did when we wrote this this one for the Turbine Theatre in London, we took songs from musicals 
and we rewrote the the lyrics and stuff to, to make them politically. So it's more political a pantomime than than just effing and jeffing, shall we say? Because I think anybody can do that. Anyone can go on stage and say, "Hello, boys and girls." Every time I come on, what you say? Beep off buttons. You know what I mean? Um, I don't think there's anything particularly clever about that. But if you're making a political statement or if you're doing something, um, you, or you. You're just being a bit more clever with it. I think that's where it can come into its own. I think, and that's what I really liked about Jim's pantomime. Now, Jim's pantomime, if you put on Jim's Davidson's pantomimes today, I don't think they'd be accepted or as funny as as they they were back then. But because that was the first time you ever saw anything like that, this is great, this is awesome. But time's moved on, hasn't it? And you have to be a bit more cleverer nowadays, I think, with um, adult pantomimes. And also Charlie Drake. Charlie Drake, brilliant. Hello, my my, my, my darling. My darling, <laughs> brilliant. Just so funny. Um, great, just great. But but like I say, you couldn't do that today for obvious and, and quite right reasons. You couldn't put a show on like that nowadays. So I think you have to be a lot more clever nowadays with adult pantomime because everyone's because humour is so subjective, isn't it? You know, and uh, comedy, especially <laughs> putting your foot in it, you don't want to upset too many people. Do you like the slosh? Yes, love a slush routine. I love a slush routine. I um, I, I sometimes hate them when I come off stage, <laughs> but when I'm on stage, I absolutely love them because I used to do this thing where I'd fill my mouth with slosh and, oh. then, I, and then I'd push my cheeks together as if I was a zit <laughs> popping, which is great for the first two or three times you do it. Tastes horrible, but you know, suffer for your art. But then the inside of your lips start burning, and you keep forgetting you're on stage in the moment, and you chuck your mouth full of slush and you squirt it all out, and then you realise, oh, my mouth's hurting, oh. and it's because you put all this slush in your gob. <laughs> but I love a slush, and I think if slush is done right, it's brilliant. Again, I've been in shows where they said, oh, don't get too much slush everywhere because it's hard to clean up. I think, well, don't have a slush. If you're going to do a slush, it needs to look like anarchy has just gone on. And the, the more slush, the better. One of the best slush routines I ever saw, what I was lucky to be a part of, actually, was um, a great actor called Darren Johnson, who does the Dame in Scunthorpe. And he just goes crazy with the slush. He's slush everywhere. And he even goes into the audience and he, he'll like kiss a bloke in the audience, cover them in slush. and Oh, it's brilliant. Absolutely love it. I, I don't think you can go wrong. The more slush, the better. <laughs> Ever hurt yourself? Oh, thousands of times, yeah. <laughs> um, I once did this thing when I was, um, I fell over and I really hurt my wrist. But I was halfway through a pantomime run. I'll be all right, I'll be all right. Anyway, that was sort of in December and this run of pantomime finished at the end of January. It was quite a long run. End of January, my wrist was still hurting. So I went to the doctor to get it out of a look at it. And I broke my wrist and I'd not realised. Um, and it was like too far gone to... You know, I should have got it sorted straight mm. away, and uh, I'm not so even. Ooh, even to this day, if I it does, it clicks a little bit when I when I sort of. You can't really hear it now, but yeah, it does <laughs> click sometimes. But uh, yeah, great fun. <laughs> How much input then do you have into your roles? Well, um, in in Halifax, when I did the pantomime, it, you know, it built year on year on year, you know, and it was great to be given that opportunity. And then when I moved to, over to Hull for QDOS, it, it was kind of like, oh, you've done this before, so what? how do you do this? You know, what would be... So it was really nice. So now I'm at a position where I've got quite a lot of input, I think, you know, whether it's good or bad, <laughs> a different different thing. But, um, you know, I, I love having a... You know, I like going and watching stuff now again. So, see, beforehand, I, I never saw a pantomime for years because I was doing pantomimes. The last thing I want to do when I finished a pantomime is go watch a pantomime. Oh, God, no. <laughs> but for the last couple of years, um, I've been and seen some, and I've got, that's a good idea. Yeah, that's good. And I should have seen other stuff over the years, you know, and it, it helped me come up with ideas for different sketches and stuff. And uh, one of the best pantos I saw was um, uh, King's Theatre in Glasgow. My friend... Um, now, to me, a dame, what's a pantomime dame? It's a man in a dress, isn't it? So my friend Elaine C. Smith was doing it up in, in Glasgow, and we were having a few days up in Glasgow for the new year. And um, I said to Elaine, I said, oh, I'll, I'll drive over to Glasgow, I'll bring the family, we'll go see it. And um, I kind of forgot she was the dame. I thought she'd be like fairy godmother or something, but she was playing the dame. And she was incredible. She was easily one of the 
top two or three dames I've ever seen. But she's a funny woman. She's a very, very funny woman. Um, so now if anybody ever says to me, oh, no, no, dame's got to be a man in a frock, I think, well, just have a look at Lynn C. Smith. She was incredible. And um, just seeing other other people do do stuff and their their interpretations and ideas and stuff i think it's vital and i wish i'd have seen more pantomimes really i wish i hadn't have sort of put my blinkers up to say right i've done a pantomime right let me do something else now i'm bored of this <laughs> what was your writing process then well me and jody prenger and natalie anderson who i'm sort of the three of us together um have set up like a little production kind of company we wanted to make tv and 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 films and stuff like that so we've been writing together the three of us since we've finished the tour of fat friends which was finished in 2018 so there's been bits and pieces we've written we've written a pilot for a, a sitcom um we've written a pilot for a comedy drama as well um and everything was going so well and then covid happened and everything just went shut down um so which is but actually was quite a good thing for us really because we could sit down at home and we could um we didn't have to, this thing called Zoom came along. We didn't all have to be in the same room then. We could Zoom each other and we could work on these ideas through Zoom, you know. And we wrote um, this pantomime for the Turbine Theatre. Paul Taylor Mills, uh, who runs it, got in contact with Jody and said, we want to do this pantomime. And she says, oh, I know a guy who's good at pantomime. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we got involved and... I, I like I've said it enough in this podcast is for me the most important thing is story 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 and it was getting that story make sure that story was in there really important the story was in and then adding the jokes around that story and you know I think it's still online to watch it, it was a great show we had we had Rufus Hound playing Buttons who was brilliant as a naughty Buttons I'd love to see him as um, you know in a normal p pantomime you know child friend one because he'd be brilliant as as as, uh, as the comic in, in that I thought it was absolutely wonderful and we had um, a, you know a great great lineup of, of West End actors playing playing the other roles as well I think it's still online it's called Cinderella the socially distant ball and you can watch it I think you can download it from theatrecafe.com or whatever it's the website is but yeah it was um, it was good fun and we, we put this show together it was it worked out really well and then COVID happened and closed it. <laughs> Typical, Never mind. Isn't it? Never mind. Do you get the panto blues? Yeah, when I'm in it. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. No, I get. Uh, you mean when it's finished? And when stuff. it's finished, um, I get what I call post panto sickness. So you've been going on and on and on for 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 months and months, and then suddenly everything stops. And in January, there's not a lot of work anyway, so you're not really doing anything and. I just get so poorly and just like my body just shuts down I think um, but um, I, I I used to early in my career but I'm always moving on to something else and there's always something else coming up so I never really have time much to think about it really I couldn't be one of these people that do pantos all year round I, I just couldn't no I just couldn't do that you know I've seen that lots of people do them at February after Easter, May bank holidays, summer holidays, you know, it's all year long, I think. No, for me, it's a its a Christmas experience. And uh, yeah, that was, I, my choice, having said that, I've done a couple through, um, I did an Easter pantomime once and um, no, I just didn't, didn't enjoy it. It was, it just felt like, felt, it just felt, it just felt a bit like a, not Christmassy. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And for me, part of that experience is Christmas. <laughs> part of that experience is coming out of the theatre and it being cold and, and wet <laughs> and it's dark uh, between the evening show and mat uh, matinee. You know? <laughs> what am I doing? It's the pantomime in the summer. I'm a mad. So, so I, don't, I don't really like doing those. And uh, I, I've kind of said I don't think I'll do another one of them again. Working in the West End then, there's some people who sort of snarb or think pantomime is uh, a, a lower form have you ever experienced that sort of attitude from anybody yeah yeah very much so um I, but i don't think it's around anymore i think uh, initially it was like oh oh, oh pantomime oh, oh anybody can do pantomime well actually not anybody can do pantomime it's very it's it's a really 
a, an acquired skill, you know, to be able to do it. And I don't think, I think I was about, took me about 10 years to get pantomime really, to become really good at pantomime. <laughs> Not I'm saying really good at it, but, you know, <laughs> to, to, to feel comfortable in doing what I, yeah. I, I know what I'm doing. I like what I'm doing. And um, I just think that there was a bit of snobbery about it. But like I said, I don't think that's there anymore. I think people have become... A, well, they probably had to go do a pantomime and realise how difficult it is. Because in the West End, you're doing eight shows a week. In Money, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but in uh, in pantomime, you're doing 12 shows a week. I mean, some shows, I, mean, I've, I, I only did it one year. I did three shows a, week, uh, a day. It's like, oh, three shows a day? That third show, you're going on and you think, I've done this bit already. Uh, you know, It's crazy. But, yeah, I, I think it's really hard work. And... Um, yeah, you've got to be cut, cut from a special kind of cloth to be able to, uh, to to be able to do it and do it really well. And it did it just take a lot of time to do it. Uh, you know, in certain characters, I think characters the, the the more straight characters like your your barons and your uh, um, well captains of the ships, fairy godmothers. Mm. I think I think they can be um, a lot easier to play than somebody who's ad libbing all the time, in like a comic or a dame. Um, well, who am I? I've never played one. They might not be. I don't know. I, I presume they are more easier to play. I don't know. But um, but the, the, like we're saying, the, the, as long as you're keeping that story going and driving that story uh, and not not getting carried away, that's the hardest thing is getting carried away. And I often find with the bad pantomimes which I've seen is the actors getting carried away. It's just less is more sometimes. Less is more. Uh, which was the beauty about this pantomime me and Jody wrote. We, we wrote it. It was 45 minutes long. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> um, although a couple of occasions, it did go over to an hour long. Well, I don't know, getting very excited on the stage. It must have been. <laughs> um, but it was kind of nice. You know, it was, there was just getting on with it, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, I, I, really think, I really think that that snobbery is kind of gone now. Well, I hope it's gone. I think it has, especially with the... Uh, with, um, uh, you know, Nick and Michael put, putting the show back in the Palladium as well, and think giving it a real, if you pardon the, pu- the pun, a bit of kudos being back in the Palladium, isn't it? <laughs> um, which I, I've never seen. I'd love. I'm always busy. I've never seen the Palladium pantomime. Which was really annoying. I was working at the Palladium um, up to the run up of um, um, 2019's Panto season, and um, I was doing the, the. I work on the Michael McIntyre's big show. I part of the. The team that that prank the unexpected star of the show, and as the, the we were we were doing the show each week from the Palladium, they were started getting more and more pantoey because you know the Christmas trees are going up outside the front. I was thinking, <laughs> oh, I just want to stay here and want to see the pantomime pal- at the Palladium. You know, it was wonderful, but uh, unfortunately, I never got to see it. But uh, but one day, one day, but it's that thing though. I've always when I'm finished pantomime, I'm like, I am done with pantomime. And, <laughs> Yeah, well, it's January. Right, next time I want to see a pantomime script, it'll be November. Thank you. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> it's good fun, though. I love it. Is there anything of panto you don't like? Um, 10 a.m. shows. <laughs> no, I actually haven't said that. No, no, I don't. There's nothing about pantomime I don't like. I love it all, if I'm really honest. Um, um, yeah, though, yeah there, there is one thing that if I'm thinking about, if I'm really thinking about it, it is that doing it at, at all times of the year I just to me it just it, for me it's such a special for me it's such a special event pantomime and it's really important to get kids into theatre and because you've got all the money thrown at it at, at, at that, that time of year you can really create something spectacular whereas the, the rest of the year it just feels very diluted and and I'll just just something that just doesn't appeal to me in the slightest and I've people saying and I've got friends who do it all the year round and they love it and great good luck to them but for me I just 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 couldn't I just couldn't do it <laughs> I sound as if I'm really hating it I really <laughs> not I just couldn't I just I don't know for me it, without the Christmas element there it really loses its sparkle for me if I'm honest what's been the best advice you've been given um get a vasectomy when you've had two kids Fair enough. Um, <laughs> no, I'm only joking. I'm only joking. Put them scissors away. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, the best advice that, in regards to pantomime. Yes. So the best advice I've ever been given is to balance the story with the anarchy. Because if you don't, if you, 
and this is on a directorial side of it as well and a, and a writing side and a performance side if you don't balance the story with the anarchy it becomes disjoint it becomes um, unbalanced you know for every kid in that audience that that loves the because the pies and the falling over there's the there's that kid as well who loves the story of the princess and 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 loves the love story as well and i think i think it's it's sort of ironing itself out in recent years i've kind of seen it it is that story element is getting across but i know i was part of a lot of pantomimes over the years that that just totally got that wrong and it was all about anarchy 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 everyone's laughing they love this bit well actually they do love this bit but actually you need light and shade don't you you know and, and i think that's probably the most important thing i was ever taught about it and it took years to learn it and it took years to understand that that is vital the pathos then of buttons mm, yeah you know if we're going to go actory and well I, yeah I, I think i think how, how did you approach that part well i've got to be honest with you the last time i did buttons was 2017 20 no 2018 no, sorry, 2016. <laughs> and the girl who's playing my buttons is my Cinderella, uh, called Carly, lovely girl, really lovely. Uh, but I'm old enough to be her dad. <laughs> and it was, I thought, oh, it's getting a bit creepy, this, isn't it? Um, but then I remember, I remember the wonderful Bobby Nutt. Do you remember Bobby yeah. Nutt? I remember him saying to me, he was playing buttons once and he took it took on the role of like an uncle kind of figure to Cinderella and it was a nice way of doing that I think mm. for an older guy to be not that old I'm, I'm not even 40 but you know it's, I'm getting <laughs> that way but the um the pathos of it is, is vital and I mean there's that scene as buttons that, that, that which is you know it it can be it can be thrown away where don't worry Cinderella you know you'll still go to the ball because you know we'll, we'll have a ball for you right here here's a nine carat necklace and do the carat mm. thing with the necklace and all that uh, and I think it, it's a beautiful piece of theatre and you really kind of get on the side of, of Buttons and understand his understand his feelings for Cinderella but he can't show it because of the class divide you know even though she is a um she is working at the house and scrubbing the floor she's still the baron's daughter and there is that gap between them because he's just a servant who works for the baron i think that's lovely but there are also moments like that for for um what i call proper acting moments that that's one of them the, the you know buttons who love cinderella and and can't tell her that he loves her you know and, and it's the same for um um dame trot in, in jack and the beanstalk where she has to sell daisy you know that God, if you, you if you nail the the selling of Daisy, it can be like it can be like Hamlet, it can be Macbeth. Yeah. You know, it's it's that it's so important. You know that you you're creating pathos, and if you've done your storytelling right, it all goes back to story, doesn't it? If you've told the story right, then the audience will be so wrapped up in in Buttons as love story. Uh, in, in Dame Trot's love story with Daisy the cow, you know, as ridiculous as all this conversation sounds, <laughs> it's story, 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 nail the story, and you'll you'll get that pathos, and you'll get the payoff at the end. Yeah, the pin drop moment, as the I like pin to call drop it. moment, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's so important, and like I said, it took me years to work that out, years, and yeah, I must have been. Oh, God, can't remember how many pantomimes I've done, but I know it took me a good ten years to really work out that that that's vital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mentioned then about being an old buttons, and that was a few years ago now. You played yeah, buttons. Yeah. Could you ever see yourself in the role of Dame? <gasps> Putting the breasts on? Well, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, I look like a Dame. I think I think when I've seen myself, I think yeah, you'd look funny. You know, I'm a you know a chubby man with a northern voice i can see myself doing it one day um i don't think it's i always said by the time i'm 40 it's time to move from comic to dame but i don't think i can't see that happening very soon if i'm honest i'm 39 no 38 at the minute crikey time flies when you having fun <laughs> um i'm 39 this year in a, in a few weeks this year but um by 40 i can't see me going to dame that soon if i'm honest um just purely and simply because I work well as a comic and I think producers know that I work well as a comic and I think they've got people who are great dames and you know the 
may not be a, a role for me to film. But I'll never say never. But but a big part of the comic for me is is going in at this issue. Act one beginners. Right here we go. Blob on that cheek. Blob on that cheek. Rub it in. There's my rosy cheeks, and I'm on. You know. <laughs> <laughs> this is your act one beginners when I'm playing Dame Crack and all that stuff you to put on and all wigs and all. oh my word, um, it's, but who knows? Who knows? Well, you've still you've got a young face. That's the thing. Oh, well, thank you. It's very kind of yeah, you to say. But it's, so. it's cherubic. Shall yes, I say. that's the one. Yeah, yeah, cherubic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So little chubby cheeks. Chubby and, cheeks. Yeah, and, yeah. And nice. And you know, it does work. It does work as um, a comic character, doesn't it? The the. the it's funny you should say that. Whenever I'm get, whenever I get cast on anything teleprong or something like that, it's always a chirpy, cheerful, chubby guy, which is great. You know, I've got to be honest with you. I, I, I love that role, and I like, you know, I like, I like playing them roles really. So it's, yes, yeah, it's, it's just, just great fun. It's just you, really, isn't just it? Just me, yeah. And um, I, fair enough, I put on far too much weight during lockdown. Um, I joined a gym. I've told you this story. I haven't told the listeners. I joined a gym in October. I went for my induction, and then when the induction happened, the day after, we went into lockdown and all gyms closed. I was like, it's a sign, I'm meant to be chubby. <laughs> but then uh, we're recording this in April, and the, 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 they just opened the gyms again. So I went to the gym on Monday, and I've just been in agony ever since. <laughs> Do you like the, uh, the parties, the party atmosphere of pantomime? Um, yeah, I do actually. Yeah, well, it's Christmas, isn't it? It, 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 it? That's what it's all about. It's party, party all the time, isn't it? Uh, but for me, um, as I, I, if I was living away doing pantomime, great. But I, I'm I, I'm still at home. I do pantomime from home. That's why I'm so lucky doing Halifax because Halifax, from what from where I live, is like twenty minutes, half an hour away. So I did ten years. I was at home every night with my kids and. You know that was more important than than the pantomime to me was being at home at Christmas. Mm-hmm. You know, and now do Hull. It's about an hour's drive, so I, you know you don't stay over. No, no, no. If the weather's bad, I'll stay over, but very rare that I will. I like to I like to be at home, and you know I, I like to I like to be a dad. You know what I mean? And and um, you know I I I live to I, I I work to live. I don't live to work. There's a a different way of looking at it isn't there and um if i go away and i'm working then you know i love all the party atmosphere it's great but when i'm you know i've been involved in pantomimes for the, especially for the last 12 years i've been at home uh d- doing them from home commuting so i can't have a drink not have a drink anyway but i can't you know i can't i can't let my hair down as much as i would particularly like to but um uh, yeah, probably I sound like a right old grump, don't I? <laughs> I'm not, I promise. I'm You're a dad. Teacher. I'm a dad. A yes, dad. I need to come home and tell me kids off. And, what are you doing that? Put that down. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like it when the family comes along to see you? Oh, I love it when my family's in, yeah. You don't yeah. get extra nervous or anything? When no, no, not at all. Um, I used to love getting my kids up for the song sheet. Um, I used to rehearse with them. Um, you know, I, I used to say... Uh, right, when, when I get you on stage, when I get you on stage, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say, uh, so what's your name? And then you'll say, what your name is? And then I'll say, and who have you come with, Mummy? And then I'll say, where's Daddy? And then you point at me, so I re- rehearse this. Uh, and he always got a big laugh, you know. And whenever <laughs> I do it, you know, where's Daddy? And they point at me, and then the audience go, hey! And I say, yeah, this one's mine, boys and girls. <laughs> um, and uh, so I used to, used to love doing that, but um, they're getting a bit old for that now, so. I've got a niece and nephew around the corner ready to, to, to come and join me on stage now. So I can get another good, ooh, I can get another good five or six years out of having my family up for the song sheet. <laughs> then it with the grandkids. Then it with the grandkids, <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably, yeah. Do you think the kids will tread the boards? Oh, no, I hope they get proper jobs. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, 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 my youngest Amy, she's very funny. She's I often say she's the funniest Hurst. Um, but my oldest daughter Katie, you know, she's not interested in the slightest. No, she's uh, um, more involved in like computer games and YouTubers and all that sort of stuff, really. But no, I, I think um, I think they see what I do for a job and uh, they love what I do for a job. They love coming to see me. They love it when I'm on telly. Um, you know, they're always you know. I was on Coronation Street uh, for a few episodes last year and. Uh, Katie, my oldest, came home and she was like, 
uh, I could tell she was dead proud. She was like, me, uh, your friend said they saw you on Coronation Street. Like, oh, yeah, what did he say? He said, yeah, 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 he's, he, he, he's on Coronation Street. Sometimes he, he, he helps out in Emmerdale sometimes as well. I was like, yeah, you're proud of me. <laughs> you can't deny it. <laughs> well, this leads me on to my last question. Yeah. Your dream pantomime. So you could be in it, you could be sitting in the stalls watching it, the cast could be alive or dead. Oh, really? Or a mixture of both, <laughs> and you can choose the production. Wow! Now you're talking about it. Okay, so my the show would have to be um, Babes in the Wood. It was my absolute favourite pantomime I've ever done because there's the lovely schoolroom scene in it, isn't there? And um, uh, there's all the Robin Hood and all that stuff. So it's fabulous. It's great, great stuff. So yes, it'd have to be Babes in the Robin Hood and Babes in the Wood. And where, well, it's got to be at the London Palladium, hasn't it? You know what I mean? Or has it? Now, now, now having said that, no, it hasn't got to be the London Palladium. London Palladium is a beautiful theatre, lovely theatre. But if I'm going to be in it, because I want to be in it, I want a little bit of this, uh, you know, I want a bit of the ka So <laughs> I need to be in this. Um, so I'd want to commute from home. So it'd have to be somewhere near Wakefield where I live, Halifax, a Victoria Theatre, where I did pantomime for 10 years because. I know everyone in the audience. They all know me. Great fun. So it'd have to be at the Victoria Theatre Halifax. Robin Hood Babes in the Wood. Um, so, who am I playing? So I would be... I'd be comic. So I'd be, I don't know, Simple Simon? Simple Simon, say. Mm. Or Silly Billy. They're interchangeable. <laughs> um, so who would my mother be? The, 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 the nurse. The nurse. Who could be the nurse? It would have to be... Alive or Dead, you say? Yeah. Or a mixture. A mixture, a mixture of like <laughs> the whole cast um, could be a mixture. Oh, all right, not sorry, somebody, not somebody half dead, even though yeah, there's a couple out there's there. There's a couple, yeah. <laughs> Les Dawson, Les Dawson oh. as, as the dame have to be. You two playing off each other would be just fantastic. To yeah, work, it'd be it? great fun, wouldn't it? Yeah, it'd be wonderful. Les Dawson as the dame, definitely. Um, then as um. Well, I'd be the good robber, simple Simon, wouldn't I? Uh, so the bad robber would have to be a great. Ooh, who could be a good bad robber? Um, Jack Black. You know, the American actor Jack mm. Black. That'd be cool. Yeah, yeah. School of Rock. That'd be good. Yeah, Jack Black. I like Jack Black. Then Robin Hood, The Rock. Dwayne The Rock Johnson. How cool would oh, that be as Robin Hood? In Halifax. In Halifax. <laughs> well, he definitely go to Halifax. <laughs> Dwayne, The Rock Johnson as Robin Hood. Now, who could be made Marion? Now, that's a good question. Um, alive or dead? Um, ooh, now you're talking. And now, see, for me, I'd go the funny route. Uh, and, and, and not a pretty princess. I'd go the real funny route. Bella Emberg. Bella Emberg <laughs> and The Rock. Can you imagine that? What a combo that would be. So we'd have Bella Emberg as Maid Marion. Uh, Dwayne, The Rock Johnson... Les Dawson as the dame, me as good robber struck, simple Simon, Jack Black as uh, um, the bad robber, the fairy, fairy. Me old mate Jodie Prenger. She's a good fairy, is Jodie. Jodie Prenger's that. Um, I think I've nailed it all there, haven't I? Sheriff of Nottingham. Oh, the, how could I how not? How could you forget? <laughs> the Sheriff of Nottingham. Oh, I'm so sorry. The <laughs> Sheriff of Nottingham. There's a great actor I've worked with who is perhaps the best baddie I've ever seen on stage. And when I did Robin Hood last time, Babes Wood, he played the Sheriff of Nottingham. It was an actor called Michael Garland. And he and we had a scream together. And he's an old-fashioned, uh, my darling, wonderful show, darling. And it would be Michael playing it. He was wonderful. So there you go. That's it. Anything else? That's, that's it. That's, that's <laughs> it. Dwayne The Rock Johnson as Robin Hood with Bella Ramberg as Maid Marion. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, I'll. Oh, she's dead, isn't she, Bella? Um, well, yeah, but she'd be back. No, to, we bring her back to life for this. Oh well, that's okay. That's pretty kind of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'd be great. <laughs> well, Neil, thank you so much for taking part. Oh, on the bless podcast. you. Thank you so much for having us, and uh, I feel very honoured. And thank you for my mug. <laughs> I'm going to enjoy drinking out of that. So bless you. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>